over 40 in a minute. Um, so, Caroline, I was going to ask you, I was going to kick off by asking you, uh, you know, what's the view like from Brighton? But I know <laughs> you're not in Brighton at the moment. Um, but um, how, how have you survived lockdown? How do you feel? I mean, I must say it's been sort of pretty overwhelming in the sense that all MPs say the same, that the level of the casework that we've all had has been completely unprecedented. And I think you just get a sense of just how much uncertainty and distress and worry there is out there. You know, so many people contacting us about worries to do with their own businesses. Will their businesses survive? Will they still have a job by the end of this? You know, can they access some of the government's financial schemes? I, I just think there's just so much concern and worry. So for me, although on a personal level, I'm very grateful that, you know, I haven't been directly impacted in terms of my, my own family. Um, certainly, I've, I've had a, a kind of a snapshot, I think, into, into the lives of people who really, really are on the front line of feeling incredibly worried about what the future holds. Yeah, do, do you ever struggle to sort of stay on top of it all? Yes. <laughs> I mean, this is the moment to pay tribute to an amazing staff team without whom I really would be overwhelmed. Um, but it really has been all hands on deck, everyone doing casework. There's just been such a, a huge amount of it. And I guess the other side of it is that at the same time as there is, you know, so much um, individual casework to follow up on, there's also this sense that we are at, you know, just such an extraordinary pivotal moment. Um, I mean, I'm here in Parliament today because we've just had the launch this morning of the Committee on Climate Change's progress report um, uh, about the government's progress on climate change. And I think suffice to say that, that not enough progress has been made. And this is a pivotal moment in the sense that decisions are going to be being made now in terms of how we rebuild after COVID. And if we get it wrong, if we lock in a high carbon future, then essentially that means for the next few, few decades, we're going to be going in exactly the wrong direction. So it feels as if there's both the kind of the micro level of, of, of people's individual worries and concerns at the same time as there's this big picture thing about, you know, how do we try to make sure that we bring as much pressure to bear on government to make sure that they do use this moment to set the foundations for a greener, fairer future. You know, people are talking all the time now about build back better and, and what that means, but surely something that it has to mean is that we think much more, I think, about making sure that we don't jump out of the, the COVID frying pan into the climate change fire. Yes, I mean, I, I was wondering if we might sort of go on to the environment and climate change in a moment and just start perhaps on a smaller scale because, um, you know, we've got people uh, tuning in from all over the place, uh, different corners of the world, and uh, as I say, I had envisaged you being in Brighton. So it kind of would be nice to get a perspective from Brighton, uh, particularly in this amazingly hot weather. Were you there yesterday? I was. And, um, and how, does, how does it all feel in Brighton? Do you feel that, um, you know, everybody's sort of much more on the street now, that lockdown is, that, that people are ceasing to observe uh, the rules as perhaps they should? Um, I imagine. I, mean, I feel. I feel very worried. Today, probably worse today. It. It is. It is. I'm hearing that it's very bad today, and I'm. I am deeply worried about it. I think the government has sent out mixed messages, really, and to choose, you, you know, to basically unlock the economy before we have a really robust track and trace system in place. I think is pretty risky. Uh, all of this talking up of the Fourth of July as this so-called Independence Day. Um, you know, it just feels that we've gone from one extreme of, of, of severe lockdown through to the other one without very much in between. And certainly I think that that kind of mixed message is, is causing people to feel, well, you know, maybe we don't need to be quite so careful anymore. And we've seen, you know, thousands upon thousands of people arriving at the station, coming down to Brighton Beach. And although as a city, we love our visitors and we, we depend upon them right now, you know, the city just isn't yet quite geared up to, to, to be able to accommodate them safely and you know just basic things like not enough toilets being open and so we're finding people you know basically urinating and worse on, on the beach and in people's gardens 
um, you, you know, I, I just hope that people can hang on a bit longer just till we get the city properly prepared for the huge numbers of people who understandably in a way, but you know, who want to get on a train and come and visit, we want them to hold on a few more weeks until, until the city is ready to properly be able to, uh, to welcome them. Yes. Uh, what about, uh, tell us a bit, I mean, one of the things I was looking forward to this evening is introducing you to, to members of the club, because as you know, we, we wanted you to come to lunch earlier and that didn't happen. Um, but um, you, how, how, are your, how have your own sort of personal habits changed or if, are you doing anything differently since this strange event overtook us yeah. and overtook you? Do you find things have changed? Well, actually, just on a personal level, I mean, you mentioned just there that we'd hoped to have the, the lunch that you'd very kindly invited me to. And, and the reason that I couldn't make it was because my father died. And um, I think just on a personal level, what I found most difficult is, I mean, I, I did see my mother the last weekend just gone, but that was the first time since I'd seen her uh, since, since the funeral in March. And, um, and that's just incredibly hard. You know, they were married 60 years and scarcely a night apart. And I just felt so, so much for her about, you know, trying to adapt to that reality without having people that she loves around her. And so, you know, I know that's a story that's multiplied many times over around the country that people's basic um, desires when, when something like that happens to a family of wanting to be together, it, it's been quite a hard one to, uh, to navigate. So that's sort of been in the background. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I guess I've, I've spent more time um, uh, being aware of, of how important green spaces are to us, um, being aware of, of how much more I am hearing the birds and what a fortunate position I'm in because I recognise that, you know, lots of people don't have access to green spaces, don't necessarily have gardens um, and, you know, being able to sit listening to birds is probably a bit of a luxury, but for those of us who have had that opportunity, I just hope that we can hang on to it and, and really try to make sure that as we come out of this pandemic, we're out of the worst of it, you know, we, we, we keep hold of the things that we recognise that we really, really value, like quieter streets or like the fantastic community spirit that I know has been, you know, revived up and down the country with people, you know, suddenly now knowing neighbours that they've lived next to for decades, but, but without necessarily knowing properly. So, out of this nightmare, there has been some amazing things happening. Um, and I think that the trick will be to hang on to the good things as we go forward and try to build on them and not lose, for example, that new sense of community or the new sense of just how important a clean and healthy environment is to both our, our physical and our, our mental well-being. And the generations are getting to know each other, I feel, in, in a way that perhaps we haven't. Um, quite so much. I mean, I, you know, speaking personally, you know, seeing a bit of my grandchildren and getting a sense of how they're feeling it and how strange it must be for them. Um, and one of the things that uh, I had a look at your website um, earlier, and one of the things I noticed you've been involved in is um, promoting, um, uh, what, what, what did you call it? Um, it's a, a kind of a, a course, an educational yeah. course in nature, what, what natural, history, yeah. natural history, <clears throat> yeah. Natural history for children as a, as a possible GCSE. Was yeah, that... I mean, this is something I'm really excited about. Um, yeah, I think and so. it really stemmed from a, a conversation with a wonderful woman in Bristol called Mary Colwell, who is a, a writer and broadcaster and an expert on curlies. And um, she set up a petition, I think back in, well, quite some years ago, uh, on the Number 10 website, uh, suggesting there should be a GCSE in natural history. And I made contact with her and so together we've now been campaigning on this and it looks as if the OCR exam board now is consulting on whether or not actually to go ahead and do this and to me it's so important because I'm just very aware of how so many of our young people haven't had access to the natural world in quite the same way as perhaps their parents or grandparents did and I, I uh, came across a book by a US writer called Richard Louvre the book is uh, The Last Child in the Wood. And he said something that really resonated with me. He said that we won't protect what we don't love and we won't love what we don't know. And that sense of really having to start with people knowing about the natural world around them, being able to name basic birds and flowers and so on. 
and it kind of rang true as well because you might remember there was a bit of a controversy a few years ago when one of the dictionaries was trying to drop you know words like acorn and bluebell and replace them with chat room and and uh, uh, you know different kind of computer words and there was a real backlash because people recognize that when you don't have the words to describe something then your connection to them is weakened even more so my hope is with this GCSE um, that that we can try to ensure that there's a real opportunity in the curriculum not just to do biology and physics vital though they are but to really have that kind of outside experience and, and hands-on experience with nature around us yeah yeah I mean another sort of all, all the sort of different effects of the um, of the COVID-19 uh, th I mean, first of all, there was the early stage of lockdown when very few people um, were even driving. They were frightened to leave. No, nobody, nobody was supposed to leave home, apart from Dominic Cummings. And um, we, um, so the air was better. I mean, in London, where well, I live in London, South London, it was, you know, obviously much fresher. Um, uh, and now unfortunately the traffic's built up hugely again and um I, I one of the things i worry about and i wonder what your view is on is how do we get people back on public transport out of cars yes i mean i felt how how sad it was to hear the prime minister basically urging people to uh, to get in their cars rather than use public transport and i do recognize obviously it is harder to be socially distant when it comes to public transport but I, I do hope that we can work out a way to, to do that because, as you say, you know, for so many people, ha having that cleaner air, the, the quieter streets, and in Brighton, as I'm sure is the case in many other places, you know, quite a few roads have been closed so that uh, people can walk and cycle more easily. And actually, people are rather enjoying having those roads closed to traffic and don't want to see them reopened. Um, so, you know, maybe what we need to do is, is, is as well as public transport, but, but make cycling something that is much easier. In some countries, for example, you know, they really, there's a word for them, I can't remember what they're called now, but they're like a kind of a grown-up tricycle. It's a three-wheeler. Uh, yeah. So that you don't have to feel that you have to be, you know, clad in lycra head to foot uh, and be a real kind of racing wizard. You, you can be, in my case, a middle-aged woman on a, on a tricycle and still feel quite happy sort of pootling along. And, and we could have more of that kind of thing so that people can enjoy uh, you know, propelling themselves, but without feeling that they're at risk or that they have to be, you know, the fittest person in the country to be able to do that. Do, do you do any of that yourself, Caroline? Do you, do you have a tricycle or a, or a scooter <laughs> or anything? Like I that? don't, but, but uh, actually, I mean, I, I do use the buses around Brighton because they're so good, I have to say. Um, but even as I was just speaking then, I was just thinking, actually, I would quite like a, a, a tricycle with a bit of a battery on the back just to help with the, with the hills in Brighton. I think that could yes, uh, why not? Like, go down well. Say, Brighton is quite daunting to be cycling up and down every day. You get a bit sweaty, I think. Yeah, I um, think you're right. But, um, yeah, so um, I, I, one of the th other things I picked up from you was, um, which, I, which I'd missed, I don't know whether any, anybody else had missed it, um, the government bailing out the oil and gas industry. What, what was that? When, when it was more the banks, to be fair. It was sort of the banks buying, buying bonds in, in, in oil and gas. But what the government, of course, was doing was things like bailing out EasyJet. And, and it was quite interesting to make the comparison with what Air France uh, had to go through when, when, when France, the French government, was, was giving some support to uh, the French airlines. And they made that support conditional on Air France uh, making some significant changes in its operation to become more sustainable. So, for example, reducing the number of domestic flights that were in competition with uh, perfectly good rail routes, uh, doing more work in terms of, of efficiency of engines, doing more work in alternative fuels. And it seems to me that, as I said earlier, as part of this moment of trying to make sure we do build back better, then that surely has to be to make sure that we use public money in a way that is building towards this cleaner, uh, more climate resilient uh, economy, rather than basically going back to business as usual. And although I completely accept and support, of course, that those people who work in those industries need support. And I think we need to make a distinction between giving money to, uh, to, to, to companies that will be used to support workers and giving money to companies that will be used to pay shareholders or dividends or uh, you know, the, the chief executives. So yes, let's have a, 
a transition so that it's not the workers who, who are the ones who are suffering the most from this, but just this kind of indiscriminate way of, of bailing out failing industries feels, feels like it's a, a missed opportunity. Let's get the unions around the table, government, the industry, and talk about how we can make some of these industries that are patently unsustainable, aviation, one of the fastest growing sources of greenhouse gas emissions, how do we sit around that table and, and ensure that we can have a so-called just transition, a transition that means that workers are supported, but we do also invest in a, in a greener and safer economy at the same time. Yes. Do you feel that the government, that any, anybody in the government is really listening to that sort of plea? I mean, I noticed car showrooms reopening was something that struck me as particularly jarring. Um, they they reopened before you know, before a lot of a lot of yeah. rather worthy concerns. You might think. I mean, I think the government sort of suffers from this quite dysfunctional thinking in the sense that it 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 is able to hold two entirely contradictory points of view in its mind at the same time. Uh, and so, you know, you'll hear it. So for this morning, as we had the climate change report, the Commission on Climate Change issuing its report, and I heard the minister responding to it, saying all of the right things about how we're going to be investing in green energy and battery technology and, uh, you know, climate restoration and so forth. And yet in the, in the, it's the same government that is also boasting of having the biggest road building programme in history, 27 billion pounds being earmarked to build 4,000 miles of new strategic road in England. And you just wonder how these people can hold these two beliefs simultaneously in their minds. I think it must be quite stressful. So it's quite hard to work out really how much hope to have. I think we have to have hope. And I think there are voices certainly that recognize that there are good economic reasons for investing in a green economy. In other words, if as we come out of the worst of a pandemic, we're investing in insulating every home in Britain, for example, then that is something that will have a massive job creation potential. It'll get people's fuel bills down and it'll get climate emissions down. And so there are these win-wins out there that are there for the taking if we use just a bit of imagination and, and do that. And Oxford University and others in recent weeks have been reporting on how those green recovery uh, proposals are far more uh, job intensive, but they're also having much higher returns on investment. They're much quicker to get up and running. They have positive impacts right across the country. These are jobs that you can't possibly offshore. You know, if you're trying to insulate every home in Britain, you can't, you can't do that somewhere else. So there's a lot to be said, I think, for those green projects, even in their own economic terms. You know, we're not making special pleading for, for the environment. I think there's a real opportunity here to demonstrate how economic interests and environmental interests can actually be working together in some of these areas. Yes. Do you, do you, um, do you worry about, I mean, I know obviously the environment is high on your priority list, but um, the impact on business of the lockdown, uh, I, I, it's a very difficult balance to strike, isn't it? What, I'd, I'd like you to give us some more thoughts on the, the, the problem with, you know, trying to uh, sort of keep the lockdown to be, to be safer, uh, to protect public health, but the impact on business of this lockdown, we're beginning to get a few sort of forecasts. I saw somebody from um, uh, the International Monetary Fund or somewhere uh, saying yesterday that the giving some more dire forecasts for the slump in the economy which, which has a sort of knock-on effect on health, I think, um, if, if people are out of work and, and all of that. Do you feel now that um, probably it's looking after business and getting the economy moving is almost equally important, that the infection rate is clearly going down and we've just got to sort of embrace some of the risk and and make sure that the economy gets back on its feet. It's very, very difficult judgment mm. for you or, mm. or the government. I mean, this mm. is one thing in which I think I sympathize with them. Yeah. What, what are your feelings about the balance there? I think the issues of, of the economy and health aren't quite as, as distinct as you describe in a way, because if we end up having a second peak because we have opened up too fast, then that's going to spell an absolute death knell for many businesses. So there is a, an interrelationship there. I mean, my own feeling is that, that he has gone, Boris Johnson has gone 
too fast and too far in the sense that he, what he hasn't done is to lift different measures sequentially so we can see what the impacts are. He seems to have gone for a kind of a big bang, basically, you know, July the 4th, more or less everything except the swimming pools and gyms, uh, more or less are going to be open again. And I do worry about that. And I'm not an expert more, any more than, than many others, but just listening to people like Sir David King and the, um, the Independent Sage group, I, I have a lot of time for their, for their work. And uh, they are really concerned about just how fast um, the economy is being opened up. And I think we could have gone a little bit more slower, uh, a little bit more slowly, a little bit more sequentially. Um, and I think what's driving, of course, the, the, the impetus to open up is partly the fact that so many businesses are, as you indicate, you know, absolutely desperate because they can see that government support measures are beginning to, to be phased out. And I think that's really problematic, for example, to take Brighton as, as, a, as an illustration. You know, much of Brighton's economy is in the arts, culture, creative areas. And it will be difficult for them, even with one metre um, uh, distancing, to have theatres full of people again. And yet they're going to be required to start paying some of their staff's so-called furlough money quite soon. And yet they've got no income coming in. And it seems to me that there should have been a distinction being made when the government was asking employers to contribute to the furlough scheme, which in principle is perfectly reasonable. But if those particular businesses, like creative and cultural businesses, aren't actually able to open yet, even with a one metre rule, it feels like it's too much to ask for them to start trying to, to pay back staff out of money that they can't possibly have because their businesses have been closed for years. Well, not years, sorry, it feels like it, but for months. Um, so I, I think there are different pressures there. And, 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 and if the government could keep some of those support mechanisms for a little bit longer, I think perhaps the impetus from, from quite so many businesses to get open again would be a little bit less and we could have afforded to go in a slightly slower, more sequential way. Yeah, well, I, I, you're, you're probably right, um, but um, we're stuck with this government for the moment. Can I just move on to um, a couple of other thoughts? Um, Black Lives Matter is one of the um, things that sort of exploded incredibly quickly here. Um, it was, after all, caused by um, an appalling incident in the US, which you'd think didn't necessarily concern us initially, but then suddenly it, it, it really did. And there was, I, I didn't, I think it was sort of accentuated by the fact that everybody had been cooped up for a long time and suddenly young people found a cause that they felt they really wanted to get behind. And I think a lot of us, the National Liberal Club, feel that it's, it's, a, it's a good cause. And um, there, there is that, um, there's suddenly been that coming together, that communal feeling uh, of, a, of a completely sort of new intensity. Uh, it manifests itself in different ways. Do you, what, are, what are your reflections on how that's gone over the last few weeks um, and where it's going to go? It's just been a bit of a phenomenon, it seems to me, and it certainly was related in some way, I think, to lockdown. Yeah, I, I think there was a real kind of shared moment of such shock and horror when people saw how George Floyd died. Um, you know, other people have pointed out that, you know, tragically, people are being killed in police custody, you know, m many times, and it hasn't had this moment of, 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 of action. And yet there was something about, I mean, literally we saw, for those who could bear to watch it, you know, you could see someone being killed in real time over the course of eight minutes. And, and because maybe, as you say, so many of us were, were, were at home and, 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 and therefore more likely to, to, to share this moment of seeing that shocking footage, I think that was part of the moment. And, and the fact that for the UK, for example, I think the context in which it was landing was also the context of Windrush and, you know, the real, I mean, that felt like a really, a, another big moment when, wind, when Windrush um, broke into people's consciousnesses because the injustice there, the, 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 the utter inhumanity that was shown to the Windrush generation in Britain, I think that kind of played into this moment of saying enough is enough. Um, and, and it has been quite an extraordinary um, outpouring. And I think, you know, the real challenge, of course, is to make sure that it, 
it turns into into real change and speaking as someone in the in the in the in the wider green movement as well as for the green party i think it certainly made us look again at how inclusive and diverse we are and i think if you look at the green movement as a whole you couldn't say that it's doing a very good job at reaching out to uh, black and, and ethnic minority uh, communities and that's not because BAME communities don't care about nature and the environment, absolutely they do, but maybe there's something about the language that we use about it, maybe it's something about the, the people that we choose to, to, to make our figureheads in, in the movement, there's something that we're doing which is not really speaking as effectively as we, as we should do to whole communities of people and so I hope that you know people in whatever walk of life they are, I think one legacy of this I would hope is that we all kind of reflect on institutional racism or, or, or discrimination or just habits that we have that are not as, as inclusive as they probably should be, definitely should be. Yes, I, I, I'm sure I endorse every word you say. We've been thinking about similar things at the National Liberal Club. You know, what, what can we do to show that we are behind that? Because as you know, we like to call ourselves the most inclusive club in London and uh, we really we really want to try and live up to that in every way um, which also brings me on to women um, how do you feel I don't suppose that I can't think of the um, the sort of Covid relevance but um, how, how where, where are you at the moment feeling that about um, you know women's representation and you've been very strong in the past on the objectification of women. Do you feel that um, progress is being made or, or not um, at the moment? Um, I mean, progress is being made, but it is always so incremental, isn't it? Um, I mean, in terms of women's representation, it's certainly noticeable even in the 10 years that I've been in Parliament that there are an awful lot more women here, finally at Westminster now. Uh, it's not 50-50 still, you know, it's only just over a third, but it's it's certainly better than it was. Um, so yes, on one level, you can say incremental change is happening. Um, when you look at the overall statistics for women in the boardroom, if you look at equal pay, if you look at ongoing issues around violence against women and so forth, you know, it's very, very clear that although in incremental progress is being made, there is masses and massive more that needs to be done. And I think one question is, in a way, you know, partly, for example, there was the Me Too mo moment and, and, and that was a catalyst for, for change. But I, I do feel that we still are in need of, of, of a catalyst that would accelerate things like the fact that there is a gender pay gap even, you know, in 2020. I mean, what, what, what is that about? How can that be the case? Um, so we certainly still have a lot more to do. And, and the more women we have in, in decision making, power then then i think the more likely those changes are to to take place but it's a bit of a kind of a uh we, we need to make it into a virtuous circle rather than a vicious circle i guess okay i'm going to come to my last question caroline for the moment um which is about uh, social life um which has been sort of peculiarly interrupted i mean you sp spoke about your mother and that's heartbreaking to think about her being on her own um but all of us have struggled with social distancing um, you know grandparents and grandchildren and uh, um, mums and dads and brothers and sisters um, and funerals I get involved in funerals so I mean it's um it's a very very strange thing how do you feel uh, that is going to affect our social life um, in the months and years to come do you think it's this um, is a real change in I mean, I think what it's done is to make people remember just how important other people are to us. So in that sense, you know, it might not be an entirely negative legacy that we take forward. We've, we've remembered just how important cooperation and community and helping one another, you know, we've really kind of remembered what matters. There's a, a wonderful book by Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell. I don't know if you know it, but it's a book about disaster. She looks at Hurricane Katrina and 9-11 and so on. And she looks at actually what happens, not what the TVs tell you happens, because the TV will focus on some looting in, a, in an area of, 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 um, uh, uh, of a particular city. But what she talks about is, is how disasters give you a glimpse of who else we might be and what else our communities might become. 
And there is that sense that there has been an incredible um, outpouring of, of, of solidarity with people that we don't know. I mean, on one level, you know, it was demonstrated by the, by the applause for, for NHS and care workers. But on another level, it has just been about checking on an older person in your road and, and making sure that they have access to, to, to food and whatever else they need. And, and that, I think, that sense of, of, of human beings being intrinsically social and actually pretty much intrinsically, probably pretty good on the whole. You know, we've spent a lot of time hearing from successive governments that we're all very self-interested, you know, we're, we're all out for ourselves, that competition is, is the name of the game. And actually, I think the last few months have given us pause for thought to, to think, well, in fact, cooperation and working together is something that we do more, more naturally and actually is an awful lot more rewarding. So although for, for some people, I'm quite sure the last few months have been absolutely traumatic, particularly for, for people who've been shielding and who've literally you know, pretty much seen no one, that must be immensely difficult. But for those of us who haven't been in quite such an extreme situation, then I think there has been something that's been quite heartwarming about about seeing that particular aspect of, of human nature. Well I'm very glad to hear you say that I, I'm sure I agree with it and um, I, it's nice to know you despite all your dire warnings about the, the cli climate change of the planet that actually you, there's plenty of optimism there and um, on that note Caroline I would like to open it up to um, questions I know there are several uh, lining up with them uh, and I know that the first is um, Simon Hughes. Um, I don't know where Simon is, but... Uh, I'm here, know. Rupert, there Caroline. He oh, Simon! <laughs> Caroline, thank you very much. You are, you, are the, you are the cause of my first ever online National Liberal Club event. So thank you <laughs> very much for, for agreeing. No, it's a pleasure to see you, and, and I'm really glad you're well, and condolences uh, on your loss, and, and special love from London to Brighton. Um, just one quick warning. Um, Later in the afternoon, the only bit of anywhere on my small property outside that has some is the, the bit next to the street. So there's a slight danger that my question or your answer will be interrupted by the neighbours in various ways. So, so bear with me if this is very much a, a public engagement. Carolyn, my question is this. Um, you and I have shared uh, a commitment to many things and I pay tribute to that. Um, we've shared a, tribute, shared a commitment to internationalism uh, and we have fought for us to remains a country of the European Union and frustratingly that we've now left. The government implacably want to go ahead with not extending the transition period and there's a risk that we fall out uh, by the end of the year without an agreement. Given that one of the lessons of COVID-19 has been the real failure of nationalism, uh, the real failure of internationalism to deal with these issues, the, the unwillingness to heed the World Health Organization and so on, um, and hoping, of course, that in the States, sanity prevails and a more sane president is elected. How do you, how, how do you suggest that we can work together to rebuild the idea that working together across national boundaries uh, is absolutely a prerequisite for sanity, for good health, for, for climate, common sense, and all the other things? Because it seems to me that the latest crisis is another uh, piece of evidence as to the need for an internationalist, not a nationalist approach to life? Well, it's a very good question. And I think you set a very, um, a very real challenge in a sense, because where we are right now is so depressing in the sense that we've seen governments, you know, refuse to take part in um, uh, joint procurement of, of, of PPE or, or, or vaccines or, or whatever else, simply because that might mean working alongside the EU. So the idea that they would put people's lives at risk because of their ideological objection to working alongside the EU, you know, feels pretty extreme. Um, and again and again over the past few months, we've seen Britain having this kind of, or not even Britain, but England having this kind of little Englander exceptionalism. You know, it's almost because all of those other countries have taken an app based on Google that we decided we'd do our own. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't quite as blatant as that, but it feels like it was. It feels that we are never going to take advice or look at experience or precedent from elsewhere because we always have to do things our own way, even if it's going to cause massive self-harm, which Brexit is an example of par excellence. So to try to answer your question about how we begin to roll that back, I mean, I think there are still quite a few battles to be had, obviously, within the, within the debates on the future of the EU. 
um, that we haven't completely lost yet in terms of you know, what kind of standards regime we keep in the UK, uh, whether or not we do um, bind ourselves to, UK, uh, to, to EU standards when it comes to environment and, and, and social issues. And I think, you know, certainly those of us who, who, who care about this and, and your you know, wonderful colleagues in, in the Lib Dems too are, are working hand in hand to try to make sure that we keep those values around animal welfare and environmental standards and so on. And, you know, I know that there are real efforts to uh, use things like the European movement to make sure that um, other relationships and solidarity are kept alive. But beyond trying to keep those, um, those, those, those battles being won in the right way, I, I find myself struggling to answer your question in, in a very practical way, because for as long as you've got Trump in the States and, and I'm afraid Boris Johnson here in the UK, it's quite hard to see how we're going to find that new internationalism again. And I worry in particular about the decision that was taken without any consultation, it seems to me, uh, just around a, a week or 10 days ago about abolishing DFID, the Department for International Development. I mean, as you will know, Simon, DFID had a fantastic reputation uh, at the global level of being a real gold standard when it came to development aid and support. And it was a real example of Britain's soft power. And yet because it feels like there's such a very, very narrow-minded, small-mindedness in, in government that just wants everything to be serving very short-sighted and very short-term British strategic interests. That all is now being folded into the Foreign Office. And now it seems that development, rather than being a moral good, is becoming a strategic transaction. And that really worries me. So. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer your question terribly well because I do feel that this is an area where frankly it is quite hard to bring optimism. I think if we do have a situation in the US where Biden wins, and it has to be said that Biden doesn't, doesn't inspire that much confidence, much much better as he is than, than Trump, but I mean you know he's not what we need, but nonetheless if Biden were to win then maybe that would give... He will us... have a female vice president. Well, I hope you're right. <laughs> I hope you're right. Um, and, and maybe that would be a bit of a symbol that change can happen and that, that might make it, it, it easier to make these links again. Can I, can I move us on now? Because we've got several people lining up to ask questions. Uh, Janet uh, and then Charles. Janet Berridge. Thank you very much, Rupert. Hello, Caroline. Hello. You won't remember me, uh, but we met several times in Canterbury in the 1990s. We were friends with uh, the Greens at that time and almost joined them, but then went ah. to the Democrats. Um, my husband and I have spent half of our lives basically outside the UK, um, and most of that was spent in Germany, and we now live in Berlin. Here in uh, Germany, uh, there's a lot of uh, similar talk, but even more strident about not um, supporting uh, oil, gas, uh, well, well, maybe gas, but, um, but big um, companies that are seem to be exploiting a situation and the airlines have been begging for money and the government has done a deal with them, but on the... Um, uh, condition that the government takes a share of Lufthansa, for instance. And there has been a very strong feeling, as, as um, Rupert was saying, uh, because people feel, wow, you, you can live differently. Um, you don't have to ha have a car. You don't have to uh, keep um, using uh, f uh, airplanes uh, to fly everywhere. And it's the young people in Germany who are driving this. It started because of Fridays for Future, because of Greta, but it's become a much broader um, movement now. Do you see a similar sort of movement in England or the UK coming from younger people who would say, wait a minute, it's our future. You lot have had your time, you know, you've made a complete mess of it which is what a lot of German uh, young people are saying, uh, and, and actually pressurizing the politicians to do things differently so that we do together do something about saving the planet. Thank you, it's a, it's a great question. And I think there's nothing more powerful really than the moral authority that a young person has when they look you in the eye and say, you are trashing my future. There's not much you can say to that. Uh, and it's true. 
Um, and yes, I mean, I see it more in some of the um, campaigns around the Green New Deal in the, in the UK. Um, there's a campaign here okay. called Build Back right. Better, where a lot of young people are involved. Um, and, I, and I do see them as the leaders of, of this kind of movement really now that is demanding that we, we don't settle for anything less than, than, than a greener, safer, fairer future. And I, I think what's been interesting about the past few months is that, you know, it struck me that political failure in many ways is a failure of imagination. And over the past few months, our imaginations have been stretched in ways we, we could never have anticipated in terms of seeing a government, you know, writing off 13 billion pounds of NHS debt overnight. They have stepped in and, you know, renationalized industries. They ha are paying the, the salaries of around 9 million people. I mean, we would have been told that was utterly impossible a few, a few months ago. And now it's just happening without even really much discussion and so i think that Brian, the magic money tree did exist <laughs> it did it was down the bottom of the garden all the time as we said and austerity was a political choice um but i think that does mean that it's, it gives us more um ammunition if you like for, for saying that governments can intervene for the good when they choose to because they have intervened at scale at speed with money when they, they when there was this shared sense of of emergency and I think the trick will be to keep that shared sense of emergency and an understanding that governments have a role to play uh, and that, you know, as I said earlier, in a sense, that, that, that a green recovery you know, makes the best economic sense as well as the best environmental sense in the sense that those returns on investment are far quicker and higher through a green recovery. So I'm hoping that, you know, Rishi Sunak will be listening to that. And even if he's not persuaded by the climate arguments, even if he's not persuaded by young people, he might be persuaded by the economics that show overwhelmingly that investment in, in, a, in, in a greener economy makes most sense at this particular minute. Thank you very much. Thanks yeah, a lot. Yeah, ne next question, Charles, and then Sheila. And can I ask you please to try and make the questions a bit shorter? So yeah, because can... my answers are a problem, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 Caroline. Uh, Go, Charles. Caroline. Hello. Caroline, hi. Have I, you can hear me. Is it, I'm not sure. Yes. I, you're right. Um, may I say, first of all, that we are delighted that you've become an honorary member of the club. You've made an immense contribution to the political life of this country. And I know that members of this club admire you greatly for your contribution. Um, and we look forward to seeing you now at the club as often as you can make it. The question I wanted to ask you was this, that I realized that sort of cross-party uh, cooperation is most probably at a, at a premium or difficult to come by in any circumstance. Um, one would like to think, but perhaps this is wishful thinking, that it might be possible to produce a, an alliance in favour of saving the planet, which crosses the party divide, brings in people even from the Conservative Party to join an organisation which has widespread uh, credibility. That may be very difficult. More limitedly, uh, what I would like to see, forget electoral pacts, I would like to see the, the Greens and the Lib Dems working closer together, particularly in local, local government, to promote uh, climate issues and, and to make common cause. I mean, I don't think there's a need really to cut each other's throats electorally in, in local government. And that's something that I suggest, and I don't know what you think about. Thank you for the question. And, and, and broadly speaking, I, I completely support what you say that, um, when it comes to the climate, the issue is just so urgent that we don't have time to be kind of standing on, on party ceremony. We just need to get on with it and, and make allies where we can. On the wider issue of, of working together with the Lib Dems, I mean, I think we have had some really good examples of cooperation. So, for example, uh, in West Oxfordshire, Leila Moran, we didn't stand a candidate against her in the general election. Uh, and in return, uh, the Lib Dems stood aside for the Greens in a number of local council seats locally in, in West Oxfordshire. And also, to be fair to, to, to Leila as well, she's, she's sort of made herself available to the local Green Party to kind of be held to account and to, uh, uh, to receive their suggestions and proposals and so forth. Uh, in Richmond, you know, similar kinds of things have, have, have happened. And I mean, I wish we had an electoral system that would allow us to, to, to work side by side without needing, you know, someone to stand down here or someone else to stand down there. But in the absence of that fairer voting system, it makes sense to me that we try to 
respect you know where where we have common ground and work together where where those common grounds exist and nowhere is that more vital and urgent than when it comes to nature and climate change for sure so i agree with you and i think organizations like compass do extremely useful work in this in this area thank you charles and our next question comes from sheila who will be followed by ted then there are four after that we don't know whether we'll manage to fit them all in but sheila sheila mcgurk next please If she's there, Sheila, <laughs> we lost Sheila. Right, right, right. No, I'm, I'm yeah. unmuted. I was also going to ask about the airline industry and you have addressed that question fairly fully on the macro level in terms of the economics of people losing their jobs versus uh, the, the, the need for the airlines to maybe pay back some of this money they've taken from the taxpayer. So I'm going to stick to micro uh, issues and ask two, maybe three small, quick questions. One, how will we nudge, encourage, carrot stick people to use Zoom meetings much more than flying? Question one. Question two, when will you yourself personally feel safe to fly again? And question three, what controlling measures do you think are reasonable to keep flying COVID safe? Um. I mean, I have to say that my biggest priority within all of those three is about making aviation climate safe. Um, and that means having less of it. Uh, and I think one of the best measures that I've seen that's been proposed around this is one that you may well know, but is around the idea of a frequent flyer levy, which is basically a mechanism proposed by organizations like the New Economics Foundation, a mechanism whereby if you were to fly just once a year, the price of your flight would be much the same as it is now. But as soon as you took your second, third, fourth, fifth flight, then it would ratchet up massively and be a huge disincentive. And the reason for thinking that way, I think, is because it seems important to me to try to work out how we ration, for want of a better word, access to aviation in a, in a fair way, given that we can't go on growing aviation in the way that it has been growing. Otherwise, we will just simply bust all of our climate budgets and have no climate budget, carbon budget left over for any other part of industry. Um, but how do we do that in such a way that it isn't just the richest that can carry on with business as usual? And, you know, the family that has saved up for, for a holiday and, you know, they fly once a year, if that, uh, you know, we don't want to penalise them. So I think the best way to try to, um, to constrain aviation and to make it uh, less attractive than, 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 than Zoom, for example, would be to make sure that all of those business flights and people who are flying for business, you know, on a, on a weekly basis, literally, will recognise that it is going to cost them a huge amount to do that. And I think that would actually be quite a, quite a good incentive. Brilliant, Thank you. brilliant idea. Um, <coughs> Ted Townsend is next. Hi, Caroline. Um, I'd like to ask, ask you what you think are the key differences in policies between the Lib Dems and the Greens. We're often lumped together. Uh, at one level, someone described to me that the Lib Dems are in, interested in uh, innovation and technology and the Greens are the tree huggers. Now, I don't know if that's fair, but that's on, on environmental policies and then on other uh, types of policies, you know, um, Guaranteed annual incomes, or the similar, or, you know, economics, taxation, education. There's a whole range of policy areas that we may not agree on. So I'm at, I'd really like to your views on what are the key differences. Well, uh, I have to say that I I feel that the Liberal Democrats have been moving closer to green policies just recently, and I would cite as an example. Uh, that you know Layla for example right now in her leadership bid is making much more of a basic income scheme I know there have been liberals talking about that for a long time but she is now you know making it a, a fairly central part of her uh, election campaign uh, and that has been a long-standing Green Party policy uh, you won't be surprised that I would challenge the um, the characterization of, of the Greens as the, as the tree huggers and, and the liberals as, as people who, who uh, embrace technology I mean I think you know, I'm happy to hug trees and, and there's a good cause for, for so doing, but appropriate technology is also very important. So I don't think the distinction is there. I think to the extent that there is, you know, one of the distinctions that I would draw maybe is about the economic policy, because I think what we've always said as Greens is that if you want to see how green another political party is, don't look at their environmental um, pledges, which are easy enough to make, look at their economic uh, pledges. And if they are still assuming that we can carry on with indefinite economic growth 
you know, without any kind of constraints, then however many green trimmings you add to, 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 to that basic proposition, it's not going to be sustainable. And my view of most Liberal Democrats, although I have to say that the term Liberal Democrat in itself almost sums up the fact that there are people on a spectrum from the old Liberals through to, uh, but not exactly the SDP now, but you know what I mean, the, 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 the people who came from a different background. Um, but many Liberals, I think, would still be of the view that economic growth, um, as we've had it, is, is the prerequisite, and then you work out how you're going to distribute the gains of that, whereas the Greens would be challenging the idea that we can carry on on a planet of finite resources, the idea that you can have indefinite economic growth I think is one that just simply doesn't stack up. So I think we kind of look at things from different ends of the, of the, of the telescope, if you like. For, for us, we start with saying, what kind of activity can the earth sustain safely and what kind of economic model follows from that? Whereas I think, and this is a gross generalization and I'm sure there'll be many Liberal Democrats jumping up and down and disagreeing with me, but most Liberal Democrats I think would start more with saying, Here's the economic model. How do we try to ensure the benefits of it are such that they support the environment and support people? And I think there is, there is a subtle difference there. Well, thank, thank you. you, Caroline. You, you have the final right, right of the final word in, in these circumstances. So uh, we'll leave it there. Nick Strugnell and then Susanna Murray are the next two. And you'll have to tell us, Caroline, when you've got to stop. Okay. I need to stop at seven to get a train back to Brighton. If seven that's on right. the dock. So Very well. Well, we'll try and dock. get Nick and Susanna in that order. I'll, I'll keep mine brief in that case. And just to prove your point about Liberal Democrats, actually, rather accidentally. Um, it's essentially, how do you get capital away from oil companies and, you know, bad investments, for a better description, into greener companies? Because I work with two companies, that, uh, one that does biodegradable plastics, and one that does carbon neutral jet fuels. Now, they're both small companies at this point, but it's it's difficult to get people to invest because, you know, they're riskier propositions, you know, and all this sort of stuff. And there are government, you know, there's the e I can't remember what, e e I S schemes and all these sorts of things which help. But it's a matter of how you get those more generally available and how you, I mean, there's, there's lots of companies that are accidentally green, but it seems that Thing, companies that are deliberately, intentionally green tend to be small, hard to invest in, hard to find, and all this sort of stuff. I mean, you talk about the jets and this company is producing, a, you know, from recycled waste, a carbon neutral jet fuel, which actually gets round to the problem of carbon, <laughs> you know, for want of a better description. Um, so it's kind of it's just a general, you know, how would you, how do you suggest that companies approach that issue of, of partly being small and secondly getting investment yeah you know, getting sort of mainstream investing world i mean there's a lot of stuff going on but yeah no i completely um i completely agree with the with the premise of the question i mean i think it speaks to the fact that we urgently need something to replace what was a very good initiative which was the green investment bank and although the green investment bank was still actually dealing with pretty big projects um that kind of sense where a bit of public money could de-risk private investment was actually a really good model and it feels to me that we we need a, a national investment bank or something similar where smaller investments could be aggregated up which would then be a more interesting proposition for investment and I think as well the pension funds have got a major role to play here because there are billions wrapped up in our pension funds pension funds get tax relief and yet they don't have to do very much in return so I think we should be making you know investment in green uh, businesses a, 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 a precondition, if you like, for the tax relief on, on, on pension funds, because there is a huge untapped potential there. And it grieves me that we're not really using that and channeling that into exactly the, 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 the area of the economy that you describe. Another brilliant idea. Um, so I think we'd better make Susanna Murray our last question, because you've only got two minutes and give her a chance to ask, ask the question and get an answer. Susanna. Thank you. Uh uh, thank you, Mr. Morrison. Thank you, Mr. McNally. And also, Caroline Lucas, thank you. I will be quick. I hope this is a yes or no type thing. Um, we've seen a very reactive response from the government for this crisis. And the dependency on cheap supplies and resources from uh, abroad, for example, the PPE from China, um, has, I argue, actually uh, um, impacted on the very early response for the crisis. 
So therefore, would you argue that key products and supplies should now be manufactured and held within the UK, not only for economic, but also for the environmental reasons? And do you feel that that would actually provide the impetus for a more resilient society and perhaps a preemptive stance for future crisis management? Well, that's a lovely question because it's kind of yes, yes, yes to, to all of that. And, <laughs> and the word that was in my mind until you said it was exactly resilient, because that to me is a real example of resilience when you know that you can call upon uh, industries and companies within your own borders to be able to provide what you need and you don't have a big international scrum and competition trying to get hold of of resources that are under huge pressure from demand from elsewhere. So I do think that there's a very strong argument in favour of that from the kind of experience we've had in the past few weeks and months. But you also point to the environmental reasons for that too. And I think there is a strong argument for saying that, um, you know, one thing for sure is that if we had our own uh, manufacturing base in this country, we could apply our own regulations to it more effectively. And that means we could have higher environmental standards, for example, the quid pro quo of that would mean that if you are importing similar products from elsewhere that are being produced to lower standards, that you have some kind of border tax adjustment so you're not undermining it. But essentially, I think it's a way of grounding capital, making sure you can regulate it, and indeed, as you say, building a, a, a greener and more resilient economy. So I hope that when we get to the point of, of learning the lessons from COVID, as we absolutely must, then I hope that one is, is high up there in, in terms of the, of the priorities that we take forward. Caroline, thank you so much. The, the hour has struck. Uh, so I'm really sorry, Ben, Westlake and Trevor, that we can't uh, fit you in. Um, so Caroline, I mean, the last question is just, you know, I hope you'll come to the National Liberal Club as I soon as possible. Well, thank you. We're opening on Monday week. I'm pretty sure that's going to happen now. Uh, Tim, whom you've met this evening, he, who's been controlling everything, um, he is going to be first through the door on uh, on monday and uh, so if 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 you'd like to come and relax on our beautiful terrace and get away from uh, your uh, colleagues in parliament um, <laughs> for a moment uh, do do come uh, down the road and see us and uh, well later in the year we'll we'll have you to a, a proper uh, meal and so on um, but well, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. For the time this evening and we look forward well, to seeing you again very soon. Well, thank you so much. And it is a real honour to, uh, to have been part of the club and to, uh, and to take part in this. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.